Okay, so I'm, I'm Jake, this is Steve. Um, I think I'm going to stand up. I don't know why. I feel slightly, slightly more comfortable talking than standing. So, the space uh, is a partnership between the BBC and the Arts Council. Uh, you'll be able to see elements of each logo. It kind of gets mashed up within the two there. Now, because we're from the BBC and uh, we always turn up places with a show reel. So I'm just going to show you a couple of minutes of some of the stuff we've had on the space since its launch in May. Um, and a fair amount of it is, is live, and hopefully this will work. of wind on the high street and instead of blowing litter that these franchises are responsible for, they're actually blowing gold leaves up the side of the building. Enjoy yourself and be happy. Nice! <laughs> That's the advantage of having very good in-house producers. So, uh, yes, I'm Jake and this is Steve. He hasn't really got a job title, but he, I kind of look to Steve when people ask me questions that mean I have to have a blank stare. Because uh, if, if I can't work something out, then he always does, does the next night. So, um, collaboration between the Arts Council and the BBC. On the day of our launch, our Director General said it was equivalent of getting two whales to mate in captivity, uh, which uh, I think is, is probably quite apt, but it's been, it's been a successful mating, I think, with lots of baby whalettes. So, our mission was to, to bring art to audiences, and I think what we really mean by that is that in a traditional broadcast television model, the cost of production and distribution is so high that you have to get large audiences, like millions, to justify being able to put the money into it. Um, but what that means is you often end up changing, morphing, diluting the true art or the intention of the artist. And the digital realm reduces that cost of production and distribution so significantly that you can now produce something much more niche, much more specialist, and get it to a sufficiently high number of people that the cost is justified by, by the appreciation. Um, building digital capacity, so precisely as, as, as you're doing with, with, with the day and working, uh, you know, teaching yourselves, and helping, uh, look, looking to other people who, who, who also need to learn this stuff. So trying to do that um, across the sector so that 
uh, small arts organisations can kind of just have a go at doing it, can be supported with the stuff they need support on, but a lot of the time being uh, kind of pointing out that it's, it's not as costly or complex as people think it is, and it's also not as difficult as a lot of the companies out there who have been selling live streaming services for the last 15 years. 15 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, it was very difficult and very complex. Now, as you're, as you're found, it, it isn't and it doesn't need to be. And also to play around a little bit with the future. So for the, the BBC, um, the digital means that getting high quality video, audio, other content onto a large number of screens doesn't need to go through half a billion pounds of, of, of equipment with 400 engineers. Uh, and at some point that world's going to change and we wanted to, as the BBC, to play around in a bit of a safe space uh, and see what happens if you kind of try to change that commissioning and distribution model. So the space.org, so we launched on the 1st of May after starting the build in uh, the December before, so it was all a little bit of a rush. Um, when the BBC and the Arts Council decided to do this, um, uh, I was asked to go and work out how to do it. I went to see the guys in Future Media, so the people who build websites in, for the BBC. They basically said, don't come anywhere near us, we've got the bloody Olympics. And so uh, it was pretty clear from day one that it wasn't going to be able to deal with, uh, to, to work with, with BBC staff and kit and infrastructure. Now that was actually quite, uh, quite a, 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 a freeing moment because with all the power and might of the BBC comes the bureaucracy and the complexity and the cost. So we basically just pulled together a team of four or five uh, people who we knew could do the job, said, build a thing like that, it needs to be ready on the 1st of May, let me know if you have any problems, um, and miraculously it worked. But it was a, it was a very agile approach, so um, I mean, if, and the BBC is very adverse to, to risk, so um, if the BBC had done a risk assessment on what you were going to actually do on that day when you were launching, then mm. they would have said, no, don't do it. But this is kind of by the seat of the pants. You've had the same experience as well. Mm. You just do it, and then you've got to patch things afterwards. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, it's the it. learning experience it's about, and actually doing something instead of going, well, let's not do it. Let's wait five years until we've got this absolutely perfect, then do it, and then it's too late. So. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of the sort of startup mentality. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, it's globally available. There's no GOIP blocking, blocking free, ad free. We try to get a nice variety of, of the sizes of, 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 of organizations who, who we work with. Um, it's very lightly curated, so we don't tell people what they have to say about their stuff, we don't change their artistic vision, we just try and put a sort of wrapper uh, around that to, to give it some context. And yes, we've got live, uh, live output as well as video on demand, audio images, text, blah, 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 and interactive stuff. Um, the, what I'll actually do, I, I won't go to the live website, but I'll show you what it looks like, so that's the front page. Uh, it works across all devices, so tablets, smartphones, uh, connected televisions, so Freeview HD channel 232 and Freesat channel 203 or something. You've got all of the content there. Um, that's the visual media theatre. In, in the back end of this is a heavily modified WordPress, which is... Yes, yeah, so it's interested. driven through WordPress, so we decided we wanted to build everything where we could on open source or free or easily pay-as-you-go services. Uh, so we don't we don't own any boxes. We haven't paid for any software or any licenses. And um, the, yeah, the other thing is because uh, it's open source, and at some point the code will be available. Yeah, at some point we'll make the, a space like thing available on an open source license that anyone can use. So for people who are thinking about building players and the like, there's there's there are things that we can give you. Um, yes, and it includes quite a lot of live streaming. So since the first of May. Um, we've, we've done these. Um, so, uh, Vanilla Galleries was uh, over a number of days, a bunch of artists in the studio basically being filmed for seven hours a day. Some of that was pretty, pretty far out, but that was, it was, a, it was a good thing to start with, I think. Uh, David Shrigley's opera um, from the South Bank, Breaking Convention, we, we had Blasty, who I believe were here, were here earlier on, who were extremely... Someone from Blasty here today? 
Uh, I heard we were coming, so, yeah. Yeah, oh, they yeah. ran off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Blossing Leeds Canvas. Um, Britain Symphonia, which I will quickly show you, because this is, it is live streaming, but it's not live streaming as you think about it, as you would have thought of it. So, essentially, some computer scientists and, some, and a cellist <laughs> built musical algorithms that listen to 500 Twitter accounts and based on the meaning and the sentiment and the timbre of what's being said, generatively creates music. So this piece has been running, constantly changing for about three and a half months now. And uh, I hope we never actually switch it off. But this is just using a very low cost live streaming account just on a single server. I wouldn't recommend listening to that too long. Um, <laughs> but that's basically just using the same streaming service that we've used for everything. Mm -hmm. It's just the audio. Yeah. Uh, what, what's the skull and crossbones? <laughs> well, I was going to say one of these events went very badly wrong, and there's a, there's a hint <laughs> there as to, which, as, as to which one it was. We can talk about it in a moment. Uh, Britain's War Requiem uh, from Coventry Cathedral. Uh, now, Sheffield. Dockfest. Um, there was the band British Sea Power did a live score to an archive film. Now this was one that wasn't commissioned as a live stream, but kind of the week before, we just thought, well, why don't we just go and do it? So Get I went up there. And and I just took the laptop up with a firewire cable, yeah. took a uh, feed out of the vision mixer, and lo and behold, you had a live stream. So when you've got the production and the kit there, with those kind of black magic boxes that you can pick up for peanuts these days, uh, you don't really, other than an internet connection of a decent speed, you don't really need much more. And the, we, you know, this software that we used was about 300 quid, but you, could get, you can get it for free. Um, it's probably not going to work. So on the day we had combination of the, of the film and the band and we were kind of mixing between them. This is just a kind of the mixed down album version of it. Um, but yeah, from a, that, that was one of the, the, the simpler um, setups that we used, but to the user you wouldn't have really known anything any different. What was in, important in the beginning was getting the right streaming contracts in place, so it's kind of we have Streaming Wizard and Ustream is the main provider, but yeah. So Ustream's unlimited, so if anyone really wants to do anything, we have kind of the capacity at the moment. So mm. it's doing things like this is, doesn't cost anything extra apart from a couple of train tickets. Yeah. Um, what else? Uh, so turn the contemporary, Stephen Fry interviews Tracy Emin. Uh, I will talk about it a bit later, but you, know, you would imagine Stephen Fry tweeting about an interview with Tracy Emin and all the publicity around it, you'd get millions of people. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> Live streaming does attract comparatively small audiences on the night, the key bit is to have what you've produced available. Because even the next day, you'll get many times more than you get on the night. Because people you know, don't read the tweets till they get home and they've missed it. People want to view media when they want to view it nowadays. So if they don't, I mean, some people want the experience of live. I mean, that encourages people to actually go for the real live experience. But if they're viewing it streaming, sometimes they'll just watch it the next day. It doesn't matter. They want to see it on the device that they want, where they want, when they want. So the other end of the scale... Um, please work. Thank you. Um, you've got the Royal Opera House's production of, uh, of La Troyan of the Trojans, um, where um, essentially what happened was um, a French... Uh, television company was producing this uh, and so it was all kind of shot multi-camera very high level kind of you know Glyndebourne standard um, and, and, and broadcast to other parts of the world uh, but it wasn't going to be broadcast in the UK and basically we just kind of took a feed out of, <laughs> out, out, out of their machine, sent it, do we send it to a miniature truck outside? No, it, no. it was just... Yeah, so, and then you know, a few satellites get involved, but they, they don't actually end up costing that much. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's just kind of plugging into existing stuff, and then streaming it is by far is the, the easiest, easiest way of doing it. Uh, oh, something's happened there. Uh, okay. Uh, right. Um, 
I've spelt Hitchcock's Stockhouse. name. Uh, yeah, 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 well, well yeah, Stockhausen, yeah, I, I aged uh, about four years during that. Um, so the BFI, uh, we did a, a premiere of, of um, or the first time it had been shown for about 80 years of a Hitchcock film, The Ring, which was uh, live from the BFI. And that was stream only because the Hitchcock estate didn't allow it to be available on download. So there, you know, a couple of things change. One, you really need to make sure that your audience are there and know about it at the time. And two, you need to make sure that it bloody works. Because if it doesn't, and because there have been a lot of marketing before it and posters, if it doesn't work on the night, or even if there's little glitches, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's not good news. Um, right, another one. Uh, a couple of days before the Olympics opened, we had... Eddie Izzard running around the Olympic Park being interviewed by who else but Alan Yentov. Um, I am here, I am here, I am here. I am here. Oh, I, am I can here. hear him in there. I am here. You're there. All right. I think this is, yeah, I think this is Eddie to... Izzard, everyone. Yes. As you can tell, it wasn't really scripted. But so here, here was an interesting... I didn't recognise you in those glasses, Eddie. Here's an interesting are we ready setup. To go I was wearing them earlier. What are you talking about? Oh, like that. So here's an interesting setup using lots of different bits of technology that Steve could quickly <coughs> talk through. Yeah. So um, are we using, using a, a live view backpack, bonded 3G backpack uh, from the Olympic Park with a, a camera and a, a, a golf wagon. Um, and then the signal was sent back to a live pack at the, where the, they were interviewing from. And then that was connected into a vision mixer, which was then put into an encoder, which was then streamed. So it was kind of, we had a couple of glitches in, in the 3G stream, but that was basically because the cable, there was trouble with the SDI cable, not the 3G signal. So the... the um, so everyone was panicking, thinking, oh God, what's going wrong? And it's just a dodgy cable. Yeah. So um, this 3G technology is starting to get, become, work really well now. And with 4G as well, it's going to be, become easier and easier to do. Mm. But, it's challenging, but it worked out. Okay, yeah, right. Oh dear. Scissor Sisters uh, was the one that went wrong, and annoyingly, <laughs> you know, Swords Law, it was probably would have been our biggest live stream. Uh, it's a very long story as to what went wrong, but the things we learnt from it, or which were reiterated by it, is do as much testing as you can in advance, using exactly the same kit you're going to be using on the day, at, at, the at, the day. at exactly the same time of day, mm -hmm. um, and make sure you've got good lines of communication between every part of the chain, but make sure that at each part of the chain you're only talking to one person, so that then at least you can start to, you can start to, 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 to deduce where the problems lie. And if it's that high profile, have a failover system as well. So yeah, and actually, since the Scissors Sisters problems, we've put in a, a, a backup system for everything, which is we've used two main providers. One is uh, is Ustream, you know, vast kind of warehouses full of servers all over the world, and Streaming Wizard, one bloke uh, in Coventry <laughs> with his own boxes. And actually, between them, you can kind of cover you cover more or less everything. Um. Pilot Theatre, now this was, um, this was an extremely cutting edge setup. So the idea was you had a, a live performance, uh, all very, it was the one where you had um, Jesus in the film, and you could choose your own camera shot of it, so the five ones and then camera six, which was roving around. You could choose one of three uh, audio tracks as well to go with it. So you could kind of t have, have the view that you wanted changing on the fly. Um, this is the catch-up version, which basically offers the same experience, but, uh, but not as live. So that's one of the things that we're thinking starting to be interesting about the future, particularly for big multi-camera productions, is let the audience be their own gallery director. Um, you know, it, it starts to become really, really engaging. And let me finish this list. Um, right, Stockhausen helicopters. So, uh, Stockhausen's uh, out list, uh, probably pronounced wrong, was always thought to be uh, unstageable. And the wonderful Birmingham Opera Company decided to set out and prove that that was wrong. One of the 
most theoretically unstageable elements of it was the helicopter quartet, where you have four uh, musicians, each in one helicopter, flying around for an hour, each playing to a synchronised click track, uh, mixed with the sound of the rotor blades. And as the helicopters change height and position, that creates part of the musical performance as well. So you can see there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. However, it means people will watch it because it's adventurous and, you know, because there's the possibility that you might see a decapitated cellist at some point. <laughs> um, and, yeah, so there, there was a hell of a lot of planning went into that. Um, and, you know, on the, on the day, it worked. It worked beautifully. Uh, so yeah. Let's get you a little bit. Microphones in each helicopter. One, attached to the instrument. Another one, the mouth of the player. And then another microphone, the third one, is attached to the outside of the helicopter. Very good reason for that is because Stockhausen wanted the instrument and the sounds of the rotor blade to work perfectly together. So here we had uh, the audience at the venue, uh, now, which we're also kind of mixing in. This will be like watching quadraphonic the... tennis for all of you. So after 50 minutes, it gets quite um, disturbing. <laughs> but there you go. It's, it, it's, worth, it's worth watching that. And the rest of the production was absolutely incredible. Uh, right, OK. And uh, now, finally, um, uh, before we go on, on to, the, to, to the other bit, there's... Do you want to do National Theatre of Wales as well? That National. was quite challenging. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're probably more intimately involved with that. So, yeah. What? So there was uh, the... the it's, they had uh, branches, uh, the crisis, the crisis of nature, nature of crisis. Um, part of it was a sp spread out over kind of about three miles in uh, woods where there was a smurf running around that had to be filmed, but there was, there's no 3G connectivity, there's no Wi-Fi, there's no hardly a phone signal. Yeah. So uh, we had to get a sat IP truck in, and then we had to find a place for the sat IP truck where the trees weren't over 17 metres high, and then get that to work. And then that was beamed uh, up to a satellite uh, down to uh, Ustream, because it was using already transcoded stream, which was going straight to Ustream. That signal was then taken in San Francisco. That was taken back from San Francisco to Cardiff, uh, center of Cardiff, where it was put onto, uh, projected onto a screen where people were responding to that and then we were filming from there. So there was two streams. And at a relatively low cost, but a high production value was, yeah. was pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, and in fact, we'll, we can come on to the, to, to the switcher uh, yeah. at, at the end. Okay, yeah, so that's really what we, what we wanted to do. Uh, I won't read the slides out to you. Uh, what I mean by avoid being the BBC is, uh, is avoid being, you know, the people who could obviously do stuff because they do big live broadcasts and Olympics and things like that. We wanted to, to, to kind of be of the BBC but not be the BBC and to use the little, the, the bits of knowledge and expertise that have, have emerged over the last 90 years and to kind of extract those from the big systems in which they normally exist and try to apply them in a kind of in a cheap and cheerful way. But also that has been quite frustrating because uh, in some ways because the space is also viewed as the, the BBC so people have satellite uplinks and they go well you just down link it to TBC and then you can transcode it there and then but we can't because that's not what we want to do. Yeah really, so. yeah. It's quite hard to explain that to someone when they look out of our office window and there's <laughs> massive satellite dishes there. But, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've learned. Um, OK, so what, what we learned. Live streaming can be easy and can be cheap. Um, but you have to decide how important it is to you that it is a success and what degree of drop in quality, what degree of dropout, what degree of, of you know, complete no-show uh, is acceptable and, to, and, and to, to, to basically make that decision carefully and cautiously. Keeping the number of suppliers to a minimum. So there are a lot of, a lot of companies out there who can do the whole thing for you. They will tend to charge a premium. There's a lot of you know, very good you know, 
bloke in a van with one camera and a kind of local satellite link who can do those things for a fraction of the cost. Um, but if you then try and get that operation to do your vision mixing or your lighting, then you know you start to maybe in increase your technical quality but reduce the actual experience. So it's you know there are no hard and fast rules, but to, but to think carefully about what experience people have, uh, but don't just assume that only the, the big players can do can do the job. Um, and then yeah. Um, yeah, most most live streams don't get very very large audiences. I mean, there, there are there are exceptions. Those exceptions tend to be where there is a hell of a lot of partnering and marketing and promotion. So what Brian Bourne and the Guardian uh, have done has been, you know, have, have, have kind of proved that bit wrong. But I can only imagine how much uh, work must have gone into building the audience and the excitement about about those events. Um, and yeah, the last point is kind of related to, to the second, but spend as much as you can on, on letting people know about it and making it great, and as little as you can on sending stuff through the wires. So, uh, how are we doing for time? All right. All right, okay. Only 400 slides to go. Um, <laughs> right, so um, this is where I point at Steve. Uh, so this is sort of the, the basic streaming setup, but I think sort of what this is showing as, as well, in, in this kind of setup as well, that actually uh, live streaming and, and video on demand are starting to become the same thing. So actually, with modern fragmented technology, um, you kind of encode once, so you can encode to three different formats. That gets transwrapped. That's a, a word that's going to pop up again and again and again, and works across all different kinds of devices. Uh, because the video is now being segmented, and most people have chosen H.264 and AAC, uh, it does mean as soon as you broadcast something, those chunks are available, and actually you, you can get them as catch-up. So you'll see that on BBC iPlayer now, you can kind of scroll backwards through things, because it's, it's a live broadcast, but at the same time, they're creating segments, so therefore it's, it's becoming video on demand. So it's, uh, the technology is becoming easier, there's more standardization, plus, uh, there is really no difference between live and VOD anymore. So you immediately afterwards, or actually four seconds after you've had your live stream starting, it is possible to actually start viewing it. So. Um, and yeah, so the, of all of the different devices that we play out for and therefore have to produce different kind of different codec profiles, um, the one where, we, where there, still, we, there still isn't a free open source uh, system is for the bottom one, the transport streams, which is what's used to broadcast television. Uh, the cheapest we found was about £5,000 for a licence to do those transcodes. But um, you know, most people won't be broadcasting on a, on, on a, on a television network because that's kind of not the point of why we're all here. Why we're all here. Okay. That's, that's kind of related to the video on demand and free sat and free view. It's uh, uh, quite quite challenging to get the actual profiles to work on those boxes, so that, that's, that was a bundle of fun. Carry on, Steve. So, capture. I mean, um, you, have your, so you have your camera, you, have your, uh, you can have a, a, a vision mixer, and then it's the, what you do with the output of the vision mixer, really. The vision mixer can also be, be software. So uh, it's getting more and more interesting now. There's more and more IP cameras that are becoming available, so more can be actually be done in, in software. Um, on the encoder side, what we have found is that uh, hardware encoders uh, like uh, Elemental and uh, Cisco Spinnakers, they, they, they just work all the time. They don't care what the response is from the service, they just push the bits and bytes. Uh, in the beginning, we were using a, a lot of flash media encoder, live encoder, because because it's free and it's available, but the trouble is when you're using a system like Ustream, that has, um, you get server responses. So the server says it's losing bits and bytes, it reports back to FMLE, and then it gets into kind of a mess and doesn't work very well. So hmm. software like Wirecast has performed very well. Uh, live stream software works extremely well. Uh, Ustream use a rebranded Wirecast, so it's kind of, We've narrowed it, narrowed it down to a bunch of encoders that we'd like people to use, and, yeah. and if they're going to use Flash yeah. Media Live Encoder, then we yeah. need to double-check yeah. it. And, and sure we're, we're very happy to 
share our findings on all of this with anyone who's you know wondering what to go for we you know we can't we can't recommend things but we can tell you the things which have worked well for us and the things which have given us problems connectivity is very interesting um so that's part of a project i'm working on is to get connectivity anywhere um what's happening now what we've seen with bonded 3g where you bond several uh, usb 3g dongles together to get a good throughput that's starting to work well but aggregated connectivity is working really well so 3g combined with possibly satellite wi-fi and ethernet um, and actually that that's the thing that's the single thing which is most likely you to, to prevent you from getting uh, high definition or very good standard definition uh, streams so basically yeah, if you're kind of going to invest in in one thing then invest in uprating your your broadband connections or, or renting in a good one and a provider that can have a backup they can switch between the sister 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 stream the issue we had with that was internet congestion so it, the there was a response coming back from the Ustream server saying this, the quality is too low that's coming back through congestion it's gone through congestion to get there and then there's one and a half minute delay on the stream so it's mm. and then yeah i think the, the final final point is, is almost the most important which is kind of capture what you're doing almost at every possible chain. So, uh, you know, capture with cards in the camera, record off the desk, uh, record on, you know, on, on, room, on uh, sort of hardware or tape recorders locally and record up on the server. Um, that way, if something goes wrong on one of those chains, you have something rather than nothing. And catch up is more important in some cases than the live stream for the number of viewers that actually get to see the event. So. Uh, well, that's just talking about different stuff that that captures. Yep. Uh, There's the encoders. So hardware is is if if you can afford to have a hardware box, it's it's just great because it just it just doesn't care. It just pushes the the bytes to the server. And this is going into the connectivity and, and where, where that's going. And satellite's not going away anytime soon. So what we have seen, yeah, there are a number of providers turning up that are providing satellite IP that does work. So actually transcoding to the finished format on site and then sending it via SAT over IP. Um, and for you know, relatively low thousands of pounds per day to, to do it. So for large events in remote places or places where you just can't get the connectivity, you know, it would have used to cost you eight, ten thousand pounds to get a sat truck in. Uh, now you can do it for, for a hell of a lot less. And again, we've, we've found a bunch of people who we've worked with who, uh, who, who, are, who are able to, to do that. We have more research to do on that as well. Just there is kind of, there's some yeah. smaller dishes that are turning up now that you mm -hmm. can use. So I'm just going through slides where we've already said all the stuff, but yeah, the the, the tapeless recorders that you can now get for a, for a, you know between two and five hundred pounds, just plug it into your deck or your camera, and uh, you know record very high bit rates, uh, you know more than high definition. Then at the end of it, you just plug it into your computer, copy the files off, and edit. So it's a very very fast workflow. These units are also get used as for, for monitoring the stream as well. So. Yeah, already done that. <laughs> already done that. Um, okay, yes. Yeah, so I guess one of the, the decisions you might have to make is whether to whether to, to hire in or or to buy your own kit. Um, I think it comes down to how frequently you think you're going to be doing live streaming. Uh, you know, at, at the cost of I mean, the normal ratio for pretty much any hire of technology is you pay about a tenth of the purchase cost to hire the thing for a day. So if you are going to do you know, more than 10 streams over a couple of years, in which period the kit isn't going to sort of probably break or start to become obsolete, then, uh, then it, it might be better to buy. The other thing you probably find is once you've got the kit there, you'll start trying to live stream everything, uh, which you know can be uh, can be a double-edged sword. But if you have it there, at least you've always got the option to do it, at, at, and you know that that cost is sort of out of the way. But you can you can start simple, which is sort of mobile phones, and, and buy like add-on lenses. Like I've got this little Ollie clip you put onto the 
onto the phone, um, and then the main thing is to is getting good lighting. So mm. really work on the lighting, and then get a, an external microphone for the thing. So this in a stand, it will screen fine to use. Yeah, so. yeah, and and that on a stand with a very good connection will give you better looking video than uh, a good camera with a bad connection. It won't be for the catch up, but it will for the live stream. Uh, <laughs> Okay, <laughs> pros and cons of off-the-shelf services. Um, go on, you can do this one. Well, it's, I, I guess we have to go back into what you've learned through, uh, through, through dealing with some of the larger the companies, really. I mean, uh, it, it was a kind of a half miracle in the end that you managed to get such a, a, a good deal from Ustream that you know, they had actually agreed to a lot of the, the terms and conditions that, that the space had. So hmm. I think uh, Ustream has actually made it possible to, to get through this first phase. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the main thing is, you know, you, you, can, you can do very high-quality streaming uh, on something like Ustream or Livestream uh, if you don't mind ads, if you don't mind their branding on your player, if you don't mind kind of little Google adverts popping up halfway through, if you don't want to have control over who can embed your stuff, uh, if you... So there's, there's a whole load of things where essentially, you know, you, you are the, you're the product and they want you to drive, to drive advertising revenues. Now, for many people, that's fine and that, you know, that, that's good and you can even have advertising revenue sharing if you're actually getting large, large numbers of hits. Um, because of the, um, the unique way in which the BBC and the Arts Council are funded, uh, we don't really want ads popping up all over the stuff <laughs> or being you know, embedded on sites used to sell unsavoury things. So we had to be, we had to be quite firm with our with our terms and conditions um, but you know th there are there are degrees of flexibility amongst the companies out there and degrees of pricing models and there's there, there's always something for everyone you just need to kind of look around a little bit I like that what you what you said as well you know if it's free you you are the product so it's kind of nothing is really free so. mm. and there's things like just in TV which yeah I mean they're, they're stream I mean so that just shows you a bunch of 10-year-olds can put together their own kind of TV station where they're watching, commenting on World of Warcraft, and they've got a million viewers. You know, it's kind of, it's uh, us older generation sometimes. You know, it's sort of the kids have been doing this for a long time unsuccessfully as well. So yeah. we can learn from them. Yeah. And, and I think this is moving towards the, the future of, of where TV is going, where there's unlimited channels and, and everyone can, it's, everyone can have a channel that they want to see. Um, okay, yeah, so planning uh, a live event, yeah, I guess know, know who you're... Well, the, the main thing is, uh, a lot of the times, it was, it's better to have uh, uh, standard definition quality in a lower bit rate, and you know that's going to reach a wider audience. Instead of trying to go for the full HD, and then it's going to fall over. So, well, in the beginning when we were planning, we were going to send uh, three streams over to our streaming service provider, and then actually for a lot of the arts organisations that doesn't work at all, so the best thing to do is just send one reasonable quality stream and get it transformed on the fly on the, on the streaming, by the streaming server provider. And uh, the, the, Almost the best thing about live streaming is that if something doesn't work, people will nearly always blame everyone other than you for it. So people think, oh, it's just my bloody browser, or oh, it's my internet connection, or I must be doing something wrong. You know, <laughs> the BBC, it's the opposite. Yeah, yeah, the right? BBC, it's the opposite. You know, you, you, you get two seconds of black and you've got outrage from Milton Keynes kind of writing, writing letters to you. But on, in, in live streaming, the, 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 the audience are, A, they don't really know where the problem is, and also they're more, they're more tolerant because they know that it is, a, you know, it, it, it's a bit of an endeavour, it's a little bit of an adventure. And also because of the live nature of it, you're, you're part of that event and if things go wrong, you know, that's something else to talk about. So It's been great, actually, in sort of for, mm. and, and that was interesting under the Scissor Sisters because there were two or three people that claimed that they had a, a good experience if you just <laughs> keep pressing refresh all the time, so, you know, but... I, yeah, but also just, just for letting people know if something's going wrong, yeah. uh, you know, Twitter's the best way. Yeah, there'll always be someone who claims they can see it perfectly, so just retweet working. them. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, things, things, 
will go wrong, so that you just kind of have to kind of have to live with that, really. Um, making sure, making sure there's the there's the, the catch up, and also knowing, having a plan for what to do if things do go wrong. You know, that might be having a, a, a you know a card available, even that you just literally hold in front of the camera, <laughs> or, or you upload to UStream that if the signal falls away that people get to see something or yeah tweeting tweeting stuff you know it's all it, it's all kind of reasonably reasonably obvious but just 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 be prepared for it um yeah so i mean what's i think what's happened to us in this this process is we've tried to use one streaming provider and then after after the scissor sisters then we've tried to have some failover but the the problem is that we're moving more towards being like the BBC. So it's kind of if we want it to be watertight and, and even the BBC has issues every now and then. So, mm. so it costs to have broadcast style. So it's finding that thing in between that's at least a tenth of the cost of, or a hundredth of the cost. Of, yeah. But still, we have, a, we have a choice that we can mm. switch over to something if something goes wrong. And there's, there's, there's more and more people uh, experimenting in this area there's new kind of products and solutions coming out uh, and NASA previously used Ustream up until their Mars landings where they thought that they they weren't even sure that Ustream's capability to deliver like nine million streams at a time uh, was going to be sufficient so they built their own streaming thing uh, just using using Amazon so cloud hosting uh, and that seems to be kind of almost infinitely scalable. So there's one thing we're we're thinking about at the moment is is there is there a way that you can use kind of pay as you go cloud distribution contracts with a bit of nifty open source software uh, and produce something like Ustream levels of scalability and quality, uh, but just kind of paying at the rate you want or saying, I can only afford £500 worth of distribution for this. So if more than 10,000 people look like they're going to watch it, then drop the bit rate down so that more people can watch it without it cutting off. And then also, it, because it's live so close to video on demand, then combine that with the, the transcoders that we currently, they're open source transcoders that are working at the space as well. So there'll just be one system for live and video on demand. Hmm. Uh, yes, yeah, so getting the best out of your event. Lighting is important, though. I mean, just that's that's been great having a lot of the BBC mentors around because they really know how to to work with lights. So it's Northern mm. Stage. Ian Potts was up there and, and did a fantastic job just tweaking the available lights. So actually, the, the strings came over looking fantastic. So, <coughs> so yeah, as, as other things that we're we're thinking about for any sort of possible next phase are. Yeah, so basically just making it easier and cheaper, the pay-as-you-go model, um, trying to get more resilience, better monitoring, so you know more about what, how, what, who and, and how people are watching. Um, the merging of VOD and live tech, which we'll show you something about just, just in a moment. Um, add, adding social. So um, because um, the space wasn't, uh, wasn't willing to have unmediated user-generated content appearing on a BBC and Arts Council service, because you all know what happens if you, if you do allow those things, uh, we kind of had to switch that, had to switch that off. So with things like Ustream, they have a kind of chat function, so next to the video, people can just be chatting away. You know, that, that builds interest, that builds people's engagement, they'll send links out to other people that way. So it does add something to the experience. Uh, but at, 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 at this stage, we, it wasn't something that we, that we switched on. Um, accessibility is, uh, is, is, you know, it is very important and can also be very challenging with, with live events. Um, you know, the, the, I guess the closest you come to the subtitling is that kind of frequently amusing auto-generated subtitles that you get on, on, on BBC News. Um, you know, that in itself costs a hell of a lot of money even to have stuff that isn't actually very good. So, but, it, but it's something that, that, that technology and you know, voice and face and pattern recognition and translation tools will help at some point, but they're not, it's not quite there yet. Um, and then one thing I just I quickly want to show is, and this is where the kind of merging of, of VOD and live tech, which is the thing that 
that Steve built for the Philharmonia. Uh, let me just try and find it. Uh, while I'm finding, you can explain what we're trying to do, Steve. Oh, no, it's, so uh, the uh, mm -hmm. Philharmonia <coughs> have been filming the uh, Holst Planet Suites using, I think it was 37 cameras, and then they'd close mic different sections of the orchestra. And then at the uh, London Science Museum, um, what they did is, I think they set up something like 25 projectors. You could walk around the Science Museum. All the projectors, all the videos were playing in sync different parts of the orchestra. So you could hear the violins in the background. You'd be walking past the, 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 the sort of timpani. Um, so they wanted to make something that worked on the space, but it was kind of one of those, didn't quite know how it was going to happen. It seemed like it was impossible. So the idea I had was just to abuse uh, live streaming technology. This is uh, HTTP live streaming abused for kind of video on demand. So basically you have uh, six tracks here of, um, of video which are playing in sync. And the, the thing is normally when you when you break up a video and you switch between different segments, these are three seconds long, what will happen is you'll, it will buffer a bit and then it will sound horrible. So the idea was to try and make this so that actually when it played back, um, it kept, it didn't lose a millisecond. So by ab abusing a live streaming technology, um, I managed to put this thing together, which... And this is kind of what we mean by the video on demand and the live streaming. So, you, so every time you live stream, you have these chunks are being created. Another stream of work we're looking into is being able to transcode multiple streams into segments. And then for a live event, allowing that instant hot swapping. So it's only gone quiet because we're there standing. There's not a lot going on. So um, yeah, it's being able to, to kind of seamlessly switch video and audio streams during a If you press random and then grab that and just the up here. Yeah. So then the, the next thing that, um, we want to, I want to do with my company is actually build that live streaming system that allows you to take six streams in live and then be able to, to mix between them seamlessly. So. I think that's it. Yeah. Oh, I did add in, I did the classic thing of I wrote the presentation and then I went back and looked at the notes about what I was supposed to say. <laughs> so I did a catch-all <laughs> slide, which uh, I'll send these slides around, which answers the things you actually wanted me to talk about. So. Uh, there you go. Uh, when you put uh, this presentation or the know-how, how to do things uh, online on your website? Um, yeah, well, I, I can certainly I can certainly send them to the to Lighthouse. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly, certainly. But we've been having kind of streaming workshops as well, so maybe we should have a couple of more of those in the future and have a few people up. So, can you just say a word about curation mm. and some sort of choices of what goes on, what doesn't? Okay. Um, also, um, John, John could probably help out here, but so. The Arts Council announced, uh, and the BBC announced that they were doing a thing called The Space, that the Arts Council were going to be putting up money for the commissions. Uh, there was an application process where about 750 organisations applied. That was then uh, shortlisted to a significantly smaller number. Was that about 112 uh, at the beginning of the, the second stage? Mm. Yeah, and then there was there was a fair amount of, of kind of gifts, so existing works which people just wanted to make available to, to the space. Um, so essentially, because we 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 didn't want to 
to interfere. We just wanted to help bring things in to be the best possible state they could be, but in a manner that still reflected the, 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 the vision of the artist or the organisation. Um, a lot of it was a kind of post hoc curation of really seeing how things could be placed together, could be contextualised. How it actually works on a day-to-day -day basis is um, our uh, curator, Peter Manura, who's normally the head of classical music and television at the BBC, working with, uh, with Ali Cole from the Arts Council, uh, essentially look at the stuff that's coming up and as it's coming in, um, and, uh, and kind of creates a publication schedule which is nearly always complete fiction because normally we get stuff in like a couple of hours before we need to publish it. So we've got a very, very fast turnaround there. Uh, and then there's the, um, the interactive site, so as well as video and audio, there's a whole load of uh, things. I don't know if you've seen the John Peel uh, website, the John Peel Archive, but where people are essentially delivering us, and like the Philharmonia, um, a micro site which then needs to be integrated into the overall space, um, but in a manner that means it works across all of the target devices. You know, it's relatively easy to build a nice website that works on you know, Chrome, but to have that same code working uh, on, on Android, the horrific Internet Explorer, you know, tablets, iPhones, is a lot more difficult. So what we actually do for the, the space is we build for the smartphone first, because that's the hardest thing to do. And then we extend the code out. So that what it, I'll just quickly show you what that means. Uh, let's just get out of it. Um, so because of the way the, the projector has meant, I've had to adjust the, the screen resolution. This is, this is the, the tablet version. But so if I, if I squeeze it down, it turns into the iPhone version. This is kind of responsive design. And it should actually look like the screen that I showed you, which was the browser one, but just because of the screen resolution, it, it, it's not doing it. Um, with the exception of the one that Steve and I did, uh, yes, I think they were. Yeah. Oh, no, maybe not Eddie Izzard. But so there were a few kind of opportunistic ones that we, that we just Perhaps decided to 11, do. 10 or 11 additional commissions aren't there that are either BBC uh, commissions, direct ones, or there are going to be some, na some from the nation, so that yeah. some from Wales, some from Scotland, and those kind of additional to the process, aren't they? So yeah. Is that being covered from like any collaboration between the Arts Council and the no. or is that coming out of the No, same? I mean, I think that there are, it was just decided at some point that it would be good to open it out to Wales and to Scotland, and the process couldn't really have worked in the same way because yeah. uh, we don't have a, you know, the process was really complex, it involved lots of groups of people, lots of Arts mm. Council and BBC panels sitting together to look mm. at the commission. It, it, it's, it's kind of so, so the, the um, Creative Scotland uh, works with BBC Scotland to do the, uh, the Barrowland, the, Barrow the Michael Clark thing which we had a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so it's kind of a sort of emulated model, but it's not, it's not identical. I, had, um, I know that the original commission, if I'm right, was based on the proposal was to exist between May and October. Hmm. Know what the what the next phase is, or mm. that works in the process, um, or if that's ready to be released. Um, so, really in October. so the the very most I can say is there's an interview in the Stage magazine uh, with Alan Davy, the chief executive of the Arts Council, who said that it wasn't going to be switched off in October. Uh, I can't say anything else, I'm afraid. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think there's any doubt that it's going to go ahead in a, in a form. Um, and I think that there is agreement between the Arts Council and the BBC that there will be. But when that second 
stage will begin. It isn't as public or has been decided. But there is a sort of, there is a big evaluation program now taking place, looking at everything that's happened, everything that's been published, looking at uh, accessibility, doing user testing of this of the work across all of the platforms. Imagine that. Imagine having to do user testing on Android tablets, iPads, um, smartphones, Blackberries, PCs, laptops. <coughs> And imagine having to do all of that. So there's a, there's a great deal of kind of post-production analysis of, of this stage one of the space. Hmm. And I don't yeah. think it's too dangerous to say that there's a sort of, that's kind of space 1.5. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, mean, the, the, I think the, the important thing for us is that um, I think everybody in, involved, in, you know, and I mean from you know, the, the smallest arts organisations to some of the big players, to the BBCs, to the arts councils, have all had a, 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 a positive experience doing it. Uh, and uh, I, think, I don't think any of the kind of naysayers have yet been proved right. So we're, um, we're, 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 we're optimistic. Um, I think, uh, I believe there's a, some, some data about to be released. John probably knows better than I. I don't think it's too dangerous to say that the first month was amazing, and after the first month it settled down to anywhere between sort of 50 to 60 to 70,000 visitors a month, and it's currently maintaining at that. Yeah. But we, you know, we, we need to think about how those figures sit alongside other minority digital arts channels. So BBC4 when it started, Sky Arts when it started, things like that. They're very fine yeah. audiences, and this is transferable to that. Yeah, and and, and there's about the length of time it's been going. Yeah, and and I mean the the, and I actually think it's a good thing, but we didn't have a marketing budget for the space, in the way that you know even with minority stuff on BBC4, you know there would still be some publicity there. We also quite rightly, as the BBC, weren't allowed to kind of promote this independent service uh, because that would be unfair to, to other competitors. So I think, the, I think it, it's, had, uh, it's had a sufficient amount to, to justify the, the effort and the expense. And I think the most important thing is just to, to, to help show, as you know, many of you do here, that there is interest in non-mainstream arts and there are people who are passionate enough about it and clever enough at it to be able to grasp these you know, emerging technologies to make the art even better and to get it seen by more and more people. It allows everyone to have their own channel. That's, that's the, the really important thing. It's not like there's so many BBC channels and then that's it, you switch between them. Mm. You decide what your channel is. about how you guys see the space fitting within the bigger, you know, kind of dream, which is the Digital Public Space Initiative mm. the BBC. And maybe just to expand a bit more on your point, Steve, about the fact that, you know, the site was deliberately built, you know, using open source code, and the idea is at some point that the open source code will be released, mm. and therefore, you know, kind of people could build their own little spaces. Mm. Yeah. Um, could you just talk a bit more? Yeah, I could, we'll say the, 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 the notion of a digital public space is ultimately that every publicly funded or held media asset, which is a horrible phrase, but, you know, but thing, video, image, sculpture, text, um, is made available in, a, in a, a free to use online space in a manner that allows people to kind of weave in and out of different pieces and different, different collections. Um, purely on the, 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 the digitization and access and infrastructure thing, that's a massive mission. <laughs> and that's what I go back to um, after the space, which is going to be fun. Um, and then the right side of it, is 
you know, it, you can, with technology, you know that there's always going to be a way through if you point enough sort of clever engineers and mathematicians and stuff. With rights, <laughs> um, you don't, because all it takes is uh, an understandably um, um, reluctant person to say, that's mine, I don't want you doing anything with it, and there's nothing you can do about it. So actually the right side of digital public space is, is, is the toughest thing. So what the space tried to do was to say, well, let's see what some, what if you take one aspect of publicly funded stuff uh, and you make it available for uh, under you know, controlled rights framework for a limited period, what happens? Um, so that's kind of the relationship. It was like the first public outing of the sort of little sister of the digital public space. <laughs>